So let's get started with part three. There'll be others joining us, but um, I'm going to briefly go over the slides that we did at the end of last night when we got ahead of schedule. Uh, but in a matter of moments, we'll pick up with new material. So this is the season timeline that we reviewed last night. Uh, and I corrected a couple of typos since last night. Any questions or concerns about the schedule shown here? This is a slide on the Youth Protection Program with a uh, link to how to learn more about it. For... Any questions there? This is just a little bit of information about the registration process at the national level. And this is some historic information about how we ran lots and lots of turn tournaments before COVID. Uh, things were completely different last year, we're fully remote. And this year, we're hoping to get them back to closer to normal, but we don't think we'll have nearly as many teams as we did two years ago. Um, so this is what we did last year. Here's a, a general concept of what the events are all about. They're sharing, they are competitive, but there's also the notion of competition where the teams help each other during the day. Uh, there's category awards um, for robot performance, robot design, innovation project, and core values. And then there's an overall uh, champions award that comes out of each. Um, and in larger events, there's uh, maybe first and second choice or even third choice at a, a, champ, a large championship. Welcome, Sonia. Hello. And uh, here's another slide that we talked about briefly last night, um, the specifics of uh, some award names. And I mentioned that at the championship, um, here in Oregon, we uh, have a young team award and a rookie team award that I expect to see uh, going forward as well, although that is not required by FIRST. So we get to decide each year about um, some optional awards. And here's where we left off last night. Um, this is a screen capture of the main Spike Prime project screen. Uh, if you use EV3 Classroom because you've got EV3 robots, the screen looks nearly identical. Uh, the sensors are different, and so some of the blocks are different. And I want to use the, the actual Spike Prime app uh, rather than screen captures. So that reminds me, I need to, let's see, start up Spike Prime so it's there when I need it. Well, that's loading while I talk. For now, though, I'm going to go uh, forward with a, a few more slides uh, to get the slides taken care of, and then that will allow us to spend as much time as we have until 8 o'clock to um, explore the programming of robots. Mm -hmm. uh, here are nine videos that I've created. They're uh, three to 10 minutes long each. Uh, they're designed for the kids, but I think as coaches, you'll find them useful as well. Uh, there's a little bit of silliness here and there, but you can probably forgive that. Um, and um, each of them is, is designed to, to show a, a, a particular aspect of uh, a challenge and a particular technology that can be used to address that challenge. Um, rather than teaching a feature uh, it starts with a problem and then says, here's how a feature can help us here, um, which is closer to what the kids actually do when they design the robots. It does not feature last year's challenge or this year's challenge. It features um, some challenges I made up, uh, most of which have to do with 
a yellow cat that gets lost and needs to be rescued. Um, the episode nine is the most recent, as you might guess, and um, that one uh, uh, has to do with visiting a dog at an animal shelter. Um, so take a look at these. Uh, the PDF probably has these as hotlinks. So It'll take you directly to them. Uh, and the last thing here is a playlist that has all nine episodes plus a few other uh, how-to things in that playlist. So those are available to you. And they're also uh, linked to the wiki, which I demonstrated briefly last night. If you navigate uh, to the first Lego League programming page, um, you'll find uh, all these videos are, are featured there. Uh, oh, here's another way to, uh, here's how to get there from the wiki. Uh, you can use the link. Um, or you can go to the wiki, go to First Lego League Challenge, go to programming, uh, scroll down to Spike Prime software, and then uh, select videos for team members. Uh, so what might you do after today's workshop? Um, if you don't already have a robot kit, uh, you may want to buy one or borrow one. Uh, or otherwise acquire one. We talked about earlier that one way to do that is by registering the team. Uh, it's a particularly convenient way and you save a few dollars by going that way. But the kits we're talking about, or um, the Spike Prime kits are available from Lego, Lego, Lego Education. Uh, the only way I know to get an EV3 kit this day, these days is to inherit one from another team or um, already have one from a prior season. There's a slight chance that some might be available um, uh, on places like eBay, but I haven't checked. So I think then we have some auxiliary material. Um, we have we created uh, about a year and a quarter ago um, a bunch of things that we normally would do in a classroom, or if we were holding this workshop in a classroom, we would. Uh, bring our kits and we would take you through a series of ex exercises in the classroom. But since COVID is preventing us from doing that these days, um, we've documented them so that you can make your own self-study course by following um, through these four exercises and reading the two appendices. Um, if you don't see me sending you an email tomorrow or Friday with links to this material, uh, just send me a one-liner and I'll, I'll follow up. Uh, there's a chance I may forget to do that. Uh, the material uh, that I'm talking about now is designed for coaches. Um, it's layout and um, it's terminology is, is more adult-like than the videos I talked about before. So I don't recommend that you use this material for the kids. I recommend using things like the videos I mentioned earlier, but you may find this useful to yourself as an adult and preparing yourself to coach, or you might wanna share it with another adult that uh, will be playing that role. And here's our main website. You already know how to find the wiki by adding slash wiki to the main website. And you can send us questions by um, using fll-questions at ortop.org. I think we covered what's on this slide uh, orally, but here's it for in reference, and you, you should have the PDF that I emailed you this morning. Um, uh, kind of some details of, of the Spike Prime uh, hub. Um, and here's some more details on what operating systems are associated with um, which computer that you might end up using and uh, which ones are expected to work. In all cases, you'll need internet access, uh, at least to load the software and to update firmware, et cetera. You don't need internet access when you're actually doing the programming. Uh, you, do, you do need a way to get the program to the robot and that can be by cable or by Wi-Fi, except for strange reason, the Chromebook only transfers programs by, um, I said Wi-Fi, I meant Bluetooth only transfers to, uh, programs to the robot by Bluetooth. 
Here's some similar information about the EV3, uh, the, the main brick, the sensors. Um, and that's all the slides. So I can go back to any of these slides. Uh, questions, I, I should have paused more often to, to take questions about these slides. Yeah, I, had a, I just had a quick one. Do, you, do we know if uh, Windows 11 will be supported for Prime? I think it's supposed to release on October 5th, so it'll be during the season. It, it will automatically be backwards compatible with the Windows Store and the apps available in the Windows Store. So it, it's going to be compatible. Cool. And if, if there's a problem, uh, you, you can bet Lego will be on it. And uh, But Lego's got connections with Microsoft, so they're probably already uh, testing the latest version on, on Windows 11. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay, so let me stop the share and then start a new one uh, with the Spike Prime software. Okay. This. Got too many windows open, bear with me. Here we go. So now you should see the Spike Prime window. I can make it bigger. And let me start at a more central place. Here's the home screen. When you uh, first get started, you're, you're gonna wanna click on this start and it'll take you through some introductions some of which should be familiar based on your attending this workshop, um, but I recommend you go through it regardless. And it will also uh, take you through a really simple robot and uh, a, a demonstration of a real simple robot called the Hopper. And uh, that may be something you wanna share with the kids as well. Now I'm, I'm featuring Spike Prime uh, and some of the stuff I'm showing you is specific to the Spike Prime, but in a minute we're going to get into programming, and that is nearly identical between EV3 Classroom and Spike Prime. So, pretty much everything I show you about programming will apply to programming the EV3 as long as you're using the re relatively new EV3 Classroom, which is scratch based. Um, so, down here uh, are what Lego education called unit plans, which uh, is using uh, good educational terminology. And they have about five unit plans. And to get them, you need to hit download. So here's where you'll need um, an internet connection to install these additional unit plans. The one that's most relevant uh, to uh, First Lego League, well, it looks like they have now five. Oops, sorry, clicked wrong place. Most relevant is, is the yellow one. Uh, so I'm gonna click on that. First, let's see if I can scroll down. Oh, having clicking problems here. Competition Ready is the name of that unit plan. And it has a series of training camps that have the kids build the robot that I showed you uh, yesterday and, and Monday. Um, and shows them how to drive it around a little bit. And if I can get this thing to scroll, you'll see Training Camp 2 uh, has the, the kids add uh, an attachment to that robot that takes advantage of uh, this motor that's mounted in front and does some other interesting things playing with objects. And then uh, Training Camp 3 has them add a single color sensor. This robot has two, but has them add one and uh, shows them how they can write a simple program to react to lines. Um, if you have the expansion set, which you will if you uh, order the first LEGO League kit uh, from first LEGO League when you register the team, 
you'll have a second box of parts, which will give you enough uh, uh, motors and sensors and wheels and et cetera to build this larger uh, base robot called the Advanced Driving Base. And then they have a couple more lessons that feature that one. Uh, looks like two or three more. Oh, and here's, this is brand new. This is a partial solution to one of the missions in this year's um, challenge, the guided mission. Let's see which one it is. Uh, when they show you these little videos, you can make them bigger by hitting the upper right-hand corner. Oh, no, this is last year's. So in the next update, they will have a guided mission for one of this year's, but this is uh, one from last year, the replay one. So it's not brand new. It's been around for 11 and a half months. So I can make it smaller and... I could take you through some of these lessons, but you can do that anytime once you've got the software installed on a computer. So instead, I'm going to do stuff more extemporaneously. I'm going to click on new project right here. And I'm going to select word blocks that also has Python and new is something called icon blocks, which I think are language independent. Uh, as you'll see in word blocks, uh, they're true to their name, they have words on them. And if, if when you install the software, you say that you're an English language speaker, the words will be in English, but they support a variety of languages. But perhaps they're getting exhausted creating multiple languages of word blocks. So they created a sister group of blocks called icon blocks that uh, I haven't used them yet, but I'm, I'm guessing that they do the same things without the words. And that might be a nice style once you get used to the icons, but it's not where I'm experienced. So I'm not going to go there tonight. Unless we have extra time, we can go play with it later. So down at the bottom of this screen, we've got uh, a minus and a plus. And you can see that it looks a little like uh, a tiny magnifying glass. So if I click it, it'll make my bricks bigger, which I think will be helpful to you in seeing what I'm doing on the screen. Notice it's named this Project 11 because I've done some other projects, but I can go up uh, to here where it says Project 11 in tiny font and say rename, and I can call it September 1st or anything I want. And it, it added that September 1 is in the background here. So this is a project and it, we can stack blocks in this project um, at first, I recommend only one stack of blocks, but there are, are ways of having multiple stacks. Uh, we will try to talk about that next week. <clears throat> Tonight is purely um, a high-level introduction to um, get you a sense of how things are laid out. I will probably cover features too fast for you to understand them, but absolutely slow me down when you're curious about what the heck I just said or what I meant um, or anything about what I'm showing you. Um, but my intent is not to make you a programmer tonight, is to give you a feel for what the heck this looks like. Um, it's not a professional programming language, but it has many things in common with professional programming languages in terms of the programming constructs. In First Lego League, we almost always have a, a robot with at least two wheels. And the best way to cause those wheels to do things is using these I think that color there would be called magenta under movement here. Um, and it is possible to get those wheels to turn with the blue motor blocks, but you quickly get into some weird complexities of trying to control two motors simultaneously. Um, so I recommend using the, uh, the blue blocks only when you have an odd number of motors. If a lesson calls for a single motor or you or the kids uh, create a robot with a single motor, um, then probably the blue blocks are the way to go to, to program that single motor. But when you have a pair of motors, uh, particularly if they're connected to wheels um, or anything similar to wheels, uh, you'll want to use the movement blocks to control those wheels. If it has three motors, then you'll probably use the magenta blocks to control the wheels. 
and the blue blocks to control the third motor, which might have an attachment for pulling, pushing, lifting, grabbing, etc., which all could be useful on the first Lego League playing field. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with magenta ones. And I'm going to intentionally make uh, a minor mistake here by dragging out this block as my first block. And I'll read it to you. And it says, when the program starts, and that is after you power up the robot with this button, uh, which I might as well do now, um, once it's booted, which takes about 20 seconds, um, this becomes the, uh, the program start button. You have to tell it which uh, program. And I've got several in here. There's program zero, program one, program five. So I select any of these programs that I've programmed before and push this button, then the stack of blocks that I downloaded will start doing things. Um, and we'll demonstrate some of those things in a minute. So when the program starts, because somebody pushed that button, uh, it will move forward um, by 10 centimeters. So this is a kind of a hybrid of words and icons that it could use the word forward here, but it uses a forward arrow to mean forward, 10 for, uh, for 10 and centimeters, or CM for centimeters. Um, you're in the US, where we uh, are perhaps more used to inches, so you could, the kids can change to inches if they like. You can also tell it to move forward based on the number of rotations of the axle, the number of degrees that axle turns, or for a particular number of seconds. In most cases, I recommend against those uh, third, fourth, and fifth options, but there are a few cases when you'll need them, and they're there when you do. So if I change this to inches and change this to five, um, I've got a little program. And it might work, but I wouldn't trust it because I haven't told it some important things. I haven't told it how fast I want it to go. So I'm going to insert that up here and say, I want it to go, let's say, set movement speed to 25%. Um, I can boost it up later, but 100% is pretty fast. And um, if you tell it to make decisions, sometimes um, the momentum of the robot causes it to go past the, the decision point for subtle reasons we can get into next week. Um, we also need to tell it uh, where we've connected um, the wheeled motors. And um, on this robot, um, again, this one, uh, I've connected them to uh, port C and D, if I remember correctly. So I'm gonna drag this block, put it in here and say, my, my movement motors, are connected to C and D. You can see this is a graphic indicating the top of the hub. And so I'm saying the left motor is connected to C, the right motor is connected to D. And if it's going to accurately figure out how far it's going to go, it needs to know how big the wheels are. And it happens that these wheels that come in the base kit are 17 and a half centimeters in circumference. And um, that happens to be the default for this. If you use the larger wheels in the expansion set, you need to look up how big they are. Maybe they're 26 centimeters, I, I don't recall, but you would fill that in here because it needs to know how, what the distance will be traveled based on a number of rotations of the axle. So these three things should be at the beginning of every program that uses the magenta blocks. The speed you want it to run until further notice, where you've uh, connected, uh, the, the motors associated with the wheels and how big those wheels are. Now that we've done that, we can connect to this robot. And we could use the cable, but I'm going to connect here and I'm going to say I want to use Bluetooth. And since I've already paired this robot, I don't have to go through the pairing process, which involves this button here. Um, the, the new hub is this one here. So I think it's going to find it here. It'll make a a beeping noise stuff. Yeah, it beeped. I don't know if you could hear that. The, the blue thing uh, flashed and um, it made a beeping noise indicate it's connected. So I can close this screen now. And later, uh, unless we run out of time, have me show you uh, what these tiny icons mean by blowing them up. If I click this button again, we've already connected and it'll give us a 
a bigger display and it'll show us the status of the two motors that are driving the wheels, the status of the third motor, and the status of the two color sensors. So this is a good way to understand what's going on in the robot uh, even before the programs are written. Um, and it tells us we've currently selected three. So how does it know all this stuff? It's because it's monitoring the robot with Bluetooth. So that's pretty magical, actually, uh, a pretty cool feature. That's really useful for debugging a program. Uh, I could say disconnect, but I don't want to disconnect. I want to maintain the Bluetooth connection. So I'll just hit the X button back to my program. Now, there's a couple ways of running these programs. Uh, you can do them with a, a mode called streaming, where you just click the play button. But I like to use the buttons on the hub. So um, what I'll do instead is I'm going to select a program slot by clicking on that number next to the red button, and then using the right arrow to pick uh, slot number two. And then this down icon here, uh, again, there's a mix of words and, and icons. If you hover over it, it says download to hub. That may be pretty small on your end, but that's what it says. So I click on that and it shows some dots over the yellow. That means it's currently transferring with Bluetooth and it's now in the robot. But notice my robot is uh, on program two. So I push the left button here to go to program two. Excuse me, it was on three, now it's on two. So if I, I push play, the wheels will start moving. And in a minute, I'll show you what it'll actually do. But just to show you some cause and effect already, you can see the, the wheels moved, right? The, uh, these lights are on, but it's not using the color sensors. It's, uh, but when they're connected, the lights come on. If I want to get rid of that, I can uh, pull these uh, cables out of the sockets. Let me show you that. See, one of them went out when I did that. Well, they're both back on now, but we're not really using them. I'm going to put them down on a mat that you can't see, and then I'm going to switch my webcam. Give me a second here. And I think I'll, I'll stop to share to make sure that you see a fairly big version of, well, not as big as I might like, but if you select speaker view, if you haven't already, you'll see a, a, a decent size view of this map. And if I can point at my robot, if it's not obvious, there's the robot there. And this map, where the heck did I get that map? We actually designed this map uh, for people that want to practice without uh, having to share a big mat that, uh, or before the, uh, the big mat is available. And um, on the wiki, you'll find instructions for downloading a digital file and you can have it printed for about 30 or $35 at a local print shop. And you can have your own two foot by three foot mat. If you wanna put the Lego elements that you see here, the house and the airplane and the cat and the dog, et cetera, you, uh, you can buy a standard Lego kit that's also mentioned on the wiki. Um, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that next uh, uh, week, but this is much more convenient for me to use tonight than rolling out uh, a four foot by eight foot mat in, in the room I'm in. So um, I'm gonna use, I'm biased towards my little mat tonight. Um, so now that you kind of know what the heck the mat is, I'm uh, going to push the start button again. It brought up program two again, and it went forward by five inches. So I'm gonna now switch back to screen share. See if I can get back that same screen. Yeah, there we are. Um, and I'm gonna change that to 15 inches. And I need to download that because it's not in the robot yet. So I click on the two, which is still where I want it, and click on the download icon. And uh, you probably couldn't hear it, but it made a little clicking noise. And um, it's now downloaded. And you, you will be able to see the mat. And I'm going to hit the go button. Whoop.
Let's do that again. There we go. That's our 15 inches. Uh, anybody have any questions about what I've jabbered about so far? So let's change it to turning. And the turn that's available uh, in this block is a, a turn in place to the right, a turn in place to the left, or backing up. So I'm going to turn in place to the right. And I happen to know by trial and error that if I say nine centimeters, um, it'll be approximately a right turn. So that's, uh, there are more precise ways to make your right turns that we'll get to next week for sure. Slight, slight chance we'll do it tonight. Um, but this is an approximate right turn unless something's changed since last time I did this. So I'm going to download that. And the robot back. There's my right turn. So I'm going to move the robot over to the start of the road. And I'm going to add more blocks. I'm going to add a move forward. And I'm going to say I want it to go, um, let's say, seven centimeters. And then I'm going to add it. And then it'll do the right turn at that turn in the road, approximately. And then I'm going to say I want it to go 40 centimeters down the road. And then I'm going to tell it to turn left, which if I'm accidentally correct, because I didn't get out my tape measure, I do have one nearby. I should be able to get it, but I'm going to be lazy and not measure the length of the road. I'm going to just do a little bit by trial and error, but teaching the kids to use a metric or inches tape measure is definitely a good idea. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, my next step is gonna be a turn in place to the left. So now we've got these three initialization steps, go forward seven centimeters, turn, turn right, go forward 40 centimeters, then turn left. I need to download this to my robot. Okay, so on the webcam. So you can see three things. One is seven centimeters wasn't enough to get to uh, the right place to turn right. Um, Who's it probably going to go as straight as you like? And when it, and it, a three is that. 15% off site wide, like the whole site? Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, I think that was it. So, some background noise. Um, the, um, it didn't go perfectly straight, but it went fairly straight. But when it went to do that left turn, it went too far. But that was actually uh, partly because nine is an approximate and partly because I didn't say it, say nine. So let me uh, do a little trial and error improvement to the program. And download my improvements. And then tell it to go again. So that's better, but it didn't follow the dead center of the road. And uh, it went a little too far this time. Now, we can get closer and closer by either taking better measurements uh, or uh, trial and error. 
Um, but to get it to reliably follow the road, we're going to need to use sensors. And I don't know that we're going to get to that tonight, but that would be a way uh, to use a sensor. Uh, you could use the left color sensor that's already mounted on the robot to follow the left edge of the road or the right color sensor to follow the right edge of the road or some other use of um, the color sensor. Um, Sight chance will do that tonight, but uh, we'll definitely do that kind of stuff next week uh, for the follow-up class that starts on Monday evening. So while we're kind of on a roll here, I'm gonna make this program a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm gonna to try to get it to go down to where that cat is, is hiding. This is the yellow cat over here hiding in a box. So after it makes a left turn, I'm gonna tell it to go uh, 17 centimeters. And then I'm going to tell it to make a sharp right turn. Nine centimeters. And then I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I know where that third motor is, uh, which is connected to uh, not C, but to E. So I tell it to run the motor connected to E for one rotation, but that's, I, that what's connected to the motor connected to E, if I hold this here, uh, will either make this go up or down. Um, and clock eyes here will be, will be up and counterclockwise will be down. If you look at the axle, the blue part of the axle on the bottom. So I actually, to make it go down, I want counterclockwise on that motor. I don't know if I'm holding it exactly the right place, right there. So I'm going to put the robot back to the starting position. And I'm going to change this to counterclockwise. And I'm going to change it from rotations to degrees. And I'm going to say I want it to go 90 degrees. And I'm probably getting way ahead of your understanding of all, all of this, but um, again, this is a flavor and feel free to ask questions. We'll, we'll do this more carefully next week. So I'm gonna download this. Okay, so that program's in the robot. We're back to start. I'm going to hit the go button again. Okay, so if we keep adding blocks, we're going to get close to being able to capture that cat. And we might even be able to get the cat out of the box if we do it carefully. But to do it reliably, we're going to need to use sensors. and. Um, I don't think we're going to succeed in doing that tonight, but I'm going to give you some hints as to what's involved. Before I do that, uh, questions about what we just did, what this program does, and why it kind of did what we wanted to do, but we're not quite there yet. All right, let's go take a look at sensors. So we can scroll down with this scroll bar if I catch it at the right spot here. There we go. We can go to any one of these menus. And that's all pretty tiny on your end via the screen share, but there's, there's light, there's sound, there's events, there's control, there's center. So we wanna look at centers. Then there's operators, there's lots of stuff here. And there's uh, some other things called mo more motors and more movement. When you bring up your uh, your own Spike Prime, you may not see these more motors and more movement. You access them by clicking this tiny icon in the lower left. 
and it gives you more options you can add. It's, I've already done this for us, but it won't be there when you first start. So if you want more blue blocks or more magenta blocks at the bottom of the menus, you need to click on these two things. Uh, sh notice the little dots in the left-hand corner. And if you use the magnifying glass on your screen, you might be able to tell that the uh, lavender block has, has the word sound next to it. And the uh, light blue block uh, has the tiny word sensors under it. So I'm gonna click on that and it'll scroll me to all those sensor blocks. I could have done that with the scroll bar. So there's two ways of doing just about everything in this program. So what sensor might I wanna use? Well, I might want to look for a particular color. Uh, and I can select which color. So maybe I wanna look for black. Is the, uh, this is, uh, block will be true if the color sensor connected to port A in the upper left corner of the robot uh, detects black. And that's, that's a fairly good idea, actually. Uh, so where would I plug this in? I could try to drag this over here, but here's a cool thing about Scratch. It won't let you plug something in in a place where it won't work or won't do anything. So there, it didn't click into place. A hint is this is a trapezoid. And it turns out as you get used to this language, you'll gradually remember that anything that's a trapezoid it, uh, is either true or false when the program is running. So it's true if the color sensor connected to A is detecting black and it's false otherwise. So what do we do with true false? Well, we then have to jump into the, uh, not maybe not the deep end, but not the shallow end anymore and use a control block. So we go to that menu and we say, repeat until, and then notice the trapezoid right there. We can put the trape this, our trapezoid block in there and it will cause this thing to do the same thing over and over again until it finds black. Um, but what is it gonna do? We haven't told it what it's gonna do. So we need to give it something to do while it's looking for black. So we can go back up to these blocks and we can tell it to move forward for one centimeter. So what does this say now? It says, repeat until A, the uh, color sensor connected A detects black. Um, and until then, move uh, forward one centimeter at a time. Uh, when it does detect black, it will go to the next block. And since we don't have a, ne a next block, it will stop. But this might be a cool way for it to know when to make its first right turn. So let's see if I can get this thing to scroll down. I'm gonna disconnect this, move it off to the side, scroll down some more. And I'm gonna throw away this thing that goes 10 centimeters because that never was quite right. It didn't get quite to the center of the road. I'm gonna actually bring back something in a minute, but uh, bear with me. If, if I'm interpreting these blocks correctly, when I first start the program, it will start moving one centimeter at a time until it finds black. Um, and I'm gonna actually cheat and tell you that it'll be a better idea. Well, let me show you why. If we ask it to look for black, with the robot in the left corner like that, uh, the left color sensor will never find black. It will run right into the house. But if we tell it to do the same thing with the right color sensor, when it gets to the turn of the road, it will detect the black of the, of the road running to the right. So a simple change of this program, I'll tell it to use the other sensor, uh, and it'll pick up that turn in the road. Now, unless we make more changes to the program, it will turn probably too soon, but we can fix that. The advantage of using the sensor is it should do the same thing whether I start it 
let me bring the webcam up a little bit. You see my sock. Um, it should do the same thing whether we start it here, here, or here, because it'll go forward until it gets to the black there. So I need to download that to the robot. And so it did find the black. It did it kind of in a halting way. There's a way to get it to much smoother, but it did accomplish what we told it to do. A important principle that the kids will gradually get, but uh, uh, it won't be intuitive for most of them, is the robot unless there's something really wrong, we'll do what you tell it to do, not what you meant it to do. Oftentimes, they'll think they told it the right thing and it'll do what they told it to do. And they'll gradually discover that they told it to do the wrong thing. And by making adjustments to their program, it'll gradually, they'll gradually have a program that tells it what they actually wanted to do in the first place. And that, that can be for a lot of reasons. It can be because the program's right, but you, you uh, accidentally told it the wrong motors. If I ran this same program where I told it to use wheel motors, connect to E and F, it's not gonna work at all, or A and B. It has to, you have to tell it the, the accurate information, which is those, mo uh, those wheels are connected to C and D. That's just an example of how things can go wrong, even though they look right. Um, so it turned too soon because it detected black too soon. So let's fix that by telling it once it does detect black to go forward a little bit more. But not 10 centimeters. Let's I guess that's going to be about five that we want on this one. And download that. And here we go. Hey, honey, quiet. Quiet. So that was progress, uh, but it looked pretty silly the way it did it haltingly. So let, let me show you a way to make that more smooth. Uh, let's see, Chris asked when we are using multiple apps, is there an easy way to upload programs from the hub? I mean, if you're using multiple computers and you want to get a program back from the hub? Right, uh, if, you wanted to, if you wanted to make a tweak on a program that someone else had uploaded, is that possible to do like through the hub? Not in, I don't think in the way that you're thinking of it. That would be a cool thing. Instead, what you would need to do is transfer the program perhaps by a USB stick to the other computer. Gotcha. From computer to computer. So in practice, uh, what you may end up doing is either having kids uh, alternate as who's at the keyboard, or if you've got one robot and 10 kids, you might have three sub teams of three or four kids each, and they take turns downloading their current program to the robot uh, maybe you assign them a, a slot number. So team one is using slot one, team is slot, slot two, team three is using slot three, and they share one robot, and you have three programming teams. Lots of different ways of organizing it. Gotcha. Keep those questions coming. So I'm going to try to solve a uh, slightly cosmetic, but a, but a real problem if you're trying to make a competitive robot. I don't want it to jerkingly go forward for one uh, centimeter at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss that block away. And I'm going to substitute a block I haven't showed you. Um, the start moving block. Um, And if I say start moving, I, I may need to be explicit about stop moving. 
although I think this next block will take care of it, but I'll feel better if I tell it to stop. I'll put that in there. And in fact, another way to get the same thing done, and this is a little counterintuitive, if I can tell it to start moving here and then immediately check to see if it's seen black and then just keep checking and checking and that there doesn't have to be anything in this loop because the robot will keep moving while the program is checking uh, the color sensor connected to B for black over and over again. But we can give it something artificial to do. And this will be funny. A little bit obnoxious to us adults, but the kids will get a kick out of it if you show them this. I can tell it to meow. Hey, quiet. Each time it goes. Instead of dog barking, we're going to have cat meowing, which will really get. Hey, yeah, Molly. Oops. Program two. Okay, so we retrieve my robot. Oh, there's a bug in my program. No, oh, I need to take a look at my program. I, I, it did what I told to do instead of what I meant, uh, I wanted to do. Start moving forward. Uh, I'm going to take this cat meowing out that moment. Not allowed it to, to test often enough. That might have been a, a bad idea. But I need to download it. Much better. So the, the movement forward was smoother. Still didn't go quite far enough. I'll fix that. In the, in the next round, I'm going to tell it once it finds black, go nine centimeters, and that'll get closer to the correct answer. Change the nine, but I, I, I always remember to download afterwards or use the streaming mode if you prefer. Ah, oh, that's pretty dead center of the road. It's going to wander off a little bit because we can't see the road because we're not using light sensor for running down the road. But that offline was pretty good. If we did it five times, it would do it a little different every time because the only place we're using the sensors at the very beginning. But uh, I think next time, um, or that is during next week's lessons, we'll probably, because not everybody, um, will be the same. We'll probably cover some of this ground, um, but then we'll, we'll start doing things like using the light sensor to follow the edge of the road. Um, and, um, uh, other, and we'll use the gyro sensor to do a more precise right turn so that they, the turning is very repeatable. Um, for now, I, I think while you're thinking of your questions, I'm just gonna show you a few more menu things uh, on the left side. Um, where it says light, it, I would have changed that to display. Um, it displays things on top. You can give it a pattern to display or you can give it a message display. It can be as simple as a letter. I really like to use um, this one and I give it a single letter that displays on the top of it. And I, I can tell it to, uh, uh, I'll say L for looking for black. And then I can put down here, R for running down field. And why would I do that? Well, a little bit for entertainment value, but also because oftentimes the kids will think their program is in a particular part of the program when in fact it's executing a completely different part. And um, the fancy word for causing the program to tell you about itself it's called scaffolding, where you either add sounds or um, 
or displays to tell it where in the program is. And let me catch up. I, I'm getting questions by uh, text message. Can I program an extension from the same hub as my other program command? Can you re, uh, restate that? Oh, I said here, Laura first asked, do I have to assign a different hub, A, B, et cetera, if I want to program an extension to move? Um, Laura, can you kind of expand on one or both those questions for me? Oh, I don't even see. Laura, are you still with us? There she is. She's there, but she's muted. Oh, I get one. I see a little red thing here. Click. Hey, Chris is asking a question. Okay, Laura, uh, either shout out some more details or type them in. Oh, here it is. The army made move up. Okay, so that was the context. Okay, so um, there's a, a bit of confusion I've created on terminology. Um, the white brick uh, that has the buttons on it is the hub and um, the things that do things, whether it drives a wheel or a mechanism or, or the motors. So you do need to assign each motor to a port and that's yet another term it'll, it'll get it'll take a while to get used to these terms the port is just a hole in the robot where you plug something in um, so i have arbitrarily assigned the left wheel motor to c the uh, the, the port c uh, and that's where i plugged it in if i plugged it into a i need to program tell the program that that's where it's plugged in and it always has to match the program has to know where these things is because it doesn't certainly have a way of figuring that out every time. Um, and I happen to have plugged in this front motor. And if you follow the cable at the back of the front motor, oh, here's my camera over here. You take this front motor and follow the cable out of the back. It goes out and around and plugs in the E over here. So I, that's why I told it to use E uh, for wiggling this up and down. Um, and if I wanted another mechanism on the back of the robot, I would have to find a way to mount another motor on the back of the robot. And then I would cable that in perhaps to F and I could tell the program to actuate that motor clockwise, counterclockwise, or some other variations um, to do something with the mechanism on the back. So Laura, does that uh, answer part of your question? Okay. Okay, so she said yes in text. She's being shy. So let me take a look at Chris's questions. Oh yeah, so I kind of anticipated your question before I saw it. Let's, let's actually see that um, with this light display now, because I told it to display um, L for when it's looking for black. I might as well continue that theme. Um, R when it's run, running downfield, and then um, I'm going to give it one more. When it's heading down for the cat, I'm going to have it display a C. Um, oh, so this wasn't even right. This needs to be. I mean, you know, cursor problems here, but I'll get it right yet. So the R will occur after it makes the right turn. And the next display will be after it makes the left turn. I'm going to change the hello to the letter C for cat. And then when it gets, it gets ready to uh, grab the cat, I'm going to have it display a G. G for grab. Uh, 
And I think I also see I kind of ran out the clock. It's eight o'clock. So I'll demonstrate this and then let everybody go. But I'll, I'll stick around for any follow-up questions. So hopefully you can still see the webcam there. Uh, let me check that. I'm going to stop the share to um, maybe make it a little easier to see the webcam. There's the L. Now the R for uh, the R for running downfield, and then this plays the C as it goes towards the cat, and then the G when it tries to grab the cat. So thanks everybody. Uh, uh, we're done with this class. I'll, I'll stick around for follow-up questions. Um, I encourage you to, if you haven't already done so, register for next week's programming class. Uh, it'll be uh, far fewer slides, although I will have some slides. I'll, I'll try to as much as possible concentrate on, on demonstrating and answering questions. Um, and um, if you don't know how to register for next week's class, just drop me a note and I'll, I'll point you to the right place. Likewise, for any other questions that you don't get answered tonight. And I think I'll stop the recording if I can find the right button and then take final questions.